I would like to begin my presentation by sharing with you a new discovery that set the archaeology world abuzz last year. On May 14, 2012, the title of an article in the popular science magazine read, Engravings of Female Genitalia May Be the World's Oldest King Art. A more mainstream article on the Christian Science Monitor used a sensational headline that read, In France, earliest ever, ever wall art appealed to hunters and lovers. Both articles covered the discovery of engravings on a stone block in southwestern France that dates to some 37,000 years ago. A team of archaeologists led by Randall White, professor of anthropology at New York University, excavated Abri Castani, a site once occupied by prehistoric humans. The large block had fallen from its roof and directly onto a segment of the floor. As White and his colleagues broke the stone slab into sections and lifted them out, they discovered that the underside had an engraving, which they later described as a vulva image. The motif in question is a very common and also varied uh, symbol found within a 15 kilometer stretch of the Vézère Valley in southwestern France. The first examples of these so-called vulva engravings were found in 1910 and immediately interpreted by French priest and archaeologist Abbé Henri Breuil as representations of the female genitalia. Fast forward a century, and this interpretation still holds among scholars. In his previous work, White decried the use of the term art when discussing representations from the Upper Paleolithic period because of its status as a historical artifact of the later stages of the so-called Western tradition. Yet, he was quick in making an inferential lead. From the Q-shaped engraving on the block found at Abri Castani to Volpa. My goal here is not to critique Professor White or Abbe Breuil, but rather to look at these particular engravings and point out that if we continue to accept a single and simplistic interpretation which suggests that our species re preoccupation with sex dates back to the Upper Paleolithic period, we are closing the door to intelligent, well-informed inference. My research puts into question the contemporary male-centric values that dominate the interpretation of circular, oval, triangular, open-angled, and bifurcated engravings from 40,000 years ago on as female genitalia. The interpretation of these engravings has already been challenged in recent years. Some scholars saw them as schematized representations Others chose to describe them rather than interpret them. However, Breuil's approach still persists to this day and the Volpa label remains the dominant narrative. To reevaluate this interpretation, I will use the data I collected this summer, including a systematic review of all literature related to the interpretations of these pre uh, upper Paleolithic engravings, as well as a survey of museums of prehistoric art in France. I will also rely on visual data such as photographs I collected during my visit to a few sites in the Dordogne Valley where many of these engravings were found. The questions that I will address include what are the reasoning and motivation behind Breuil's subjective interpretation and how did it creep into the work of almost every scholar who uncovered and studied similar engravings after him? Is it possible to see different things other than vulvas in these engravings? Even if these engravings were depictions of anatomical body parts known as vulvas, do we necessarily know what they are all about? Can we put a big single umbrella over such range of shapes? Why is looking at them through a sexual lens problematic and why is it important for us to move away from a sex-obsessed knowledge production? For the purpose of this talk, however, I will be focusing on the first two of my proposed questions in order to, one, uncover the epistemological platform that have generated such long-lasting interpretation, 
and two, open the door to a wide range of approaches and find all means possible to uncover their potential role in the explanation of these engravings. The Perigord region in France is world famous for its prehistoric sites. In the Vézère Valley alone, between Montignac and Les Aisy, over 200 Paleolithic sites were known. The great number of sites in the region has driven a long history of research and protection. For more than 150 years, excavations and studies have continuously contributed to our knowledge, and it was here that the first three historians established a chronological framework that is still considered as a worldwide reference. An important figure in the documentation of Paleolithic art was Abbé Henri Breuil, a well-respected prehistorian. He was able to establish an undisputed position in the field at a very early age. Breuil has left a great legacy of discoveries and documentation. Nonetheless, whatever theoretical positions he adopted, he made his own and professed as doctrinal truth. Abbé Breuil's interpretation of the so-called Volva engravings is neither derived from analysis nor developed through scholarly debate. It is an assumption he made when hotel keeper, collector, and prehistory enthusiast, Louis Didon, inquired about a heart-shaped engraving on a limestone block he found in Abri Blanchard. In a letter to Didon dated January 25, 1911, Abbé Breuil interprets the engraving from Abri Blanchard as Pudende de Mulière. In Latin, Pudenda means a thing to be ashamed of, and Mulière means feminine. Breuil's argument was that such, shaped, uh, uh, such shapes are used in early cuneiform and Egyptian hieroglyphs to represent the female sex. He also proposed that male and female symbols utilized in biology trace their origin back to these prehistoric engravings. These ethnographic parallels were used to support his interpretation are erroneous. However, his initial idea continues to be perpetuated. Unlike the engravings in um, Unlike the triangular engravings placed in the high relief that depicts the female form from Rocco Sorcier near Anglesant sur Lamblin, or the pubic triangles placed on some Venus figurines to represent female genitalia, these engravings are not found in the context of female figures and cannot be interpreted by reference to the female statuettes. Most of the known figurines do not draw attention to the pelvic area. So why would there be free-floating vulvas? Furthermore, <laughs> furthermore, even if these shapes were meant to represent the female form, we have no knowledge of the cultural conventions that might have been used to depict these so-called vulvas more than 30,000 years ago. So when Professor White and colleagues announced to the world that the engraving on the block found in early origination level at Abri Castané in France was a 37,000-year-old vulva, he did so not because the image itself resembles an actual vulva, but because historically similar images have been described as vulvas. Earlier in his career, André Leroy Gourand, whose methodological working out in the field of practical archaeology were of great importance, also based himself on the achievement of his forerunner, Henri Breuil and explain the circular and enclosing forms as emblematic of female form. This traditional a priori definition is the product of a vague, prejudiced, and logically and visually unverified process of association, and continues to be the default interpretation for these upper Paleolithic engravings. This summer, at the Musée National de la Préhistoire in the town of Les Saisies, I saw a collection of engraved limestone blocks lumped together in a display with a sign that read sexual symbols of the origination. All blocks were found at a site in, at different sites in the Dordogne region and each engraving looked different, yet seven engravings out of eight were said to represent vulvas. Next to each block, a sketch accentuating the part that would make the engraving look like female genitalia is strategically placed. It was quite a challenge for me to see vulvas in these engravings, to be honest. 
First of all, the blocks were taken out of their original context as they were recovered from sites where ceilings of rock shelters had collapsed. So we have no idea about their initial positioning or from which angle they were meant to be seen. By displaying them in such manner, the museum curator is visually directing visitors and imposing on them one single possibility. These limestone blocks are from Abri du Roc aux Sorciers. They are in display at the Musée d'Archéologie Nationale in Saint-Germain-en-Laye outside of Paris. They all depict horse heads. What first caught my eye during my visit were their ears. They all bear the striking resemblance to the engraving from Logerie Haute Ouest displayed at the Musée uh, de la Préhistoire in Les Saisies. Searching for similarities in different objects is another possibility and perhaps even a better alternative than calling every single circular, oval, triangular, open angle of bifurcated engraving a bolt up. <laughs> However, this method typifies Roy's approach and it treats these engravings subjectively and imposes meaning on them, meaning that we wouldn't be able to confirm archaeologically. Relying on an a priori claim that these engravings repre represent female genitalia surely limits our ability as researchers to discover how the past was created. I will conclude my talk by stressing the importance of several equally valid approaches when investigating the complex, the complex structures of past life, rather than reliance on one preferred ideological package. Informed inferences are the product of theoretical archaeology. However, cultural predilections are inevitable when we rely on inferences. As Paul Bond stressed in his critical paper, No Sex, Please, We Are Org Nation, we need creative answers that are less based on speculation and more grounded on synthesis. It is impossible to claim certainty when it comes to knowledge of the past, so we need to use different approaches and theories when looking at the engravings on these blocks. By uncritically accepting Breu's questionable interpretation that these engravings represent vulvas, uh, we perpetuate a myth, a myth that has become a part of received common knowledge of prehistory. Trying to understand these engravings through an approach that seeks the meaning is also fraught with challenges. So for my senior year at, here at Berkeley and for my honors thesis, I will use complex methodologies and converging lines of evidence rather than one-dimensional approach to understand a period of great transition and immense duration. Thank you all.